I'm very happy to uh, introduce Catherine Devolf. We met uh, also through Liz Larner last year. We're installing her show and then we were organizing a talk with Liz Larner and she wished to meet somebody who's involved with uh, recycling. And so I called uh, Benjamin Dillenburger. He was here last year talking about new ways of uh, uh, building uh, houses and and he said, yeah, maybe I should contact Catherine. So I called, I wrote her an email, and she said, well, why don't you just come uh, outside of Zurich? We're outside of Zurich with the students. So we took a car, listen, maybe we drove out there. And there she was with a group of students dismantling um, a house. Um, Catherine is a professor at ETH, ETH, as we say. In, okay, I have to read this, in Circular Engineering for Architecture. And uh, she has uh, received a lot of awards. She has some amazing projects, but what I learned then from the talk she had with uh, Liz Larner was actually the way we forgot to appreciate uh, material. You know, I think recycling is bullshit, to use uh, the um, uh, Barbara's uh, word. Actually, we should reuse, not recycle. So that's these two things that I already learned from Catherine. I'm very grateful for that. So the value of material and the importance of reuse. Give Catherine a big round of applause. Thank you for coming, Catherine. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this very kind introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, uh, dear friends of the arts, uh, to talk about hope. Because uh, since I was a little child, I was always having this sense of wondering, wondering how things were working and how we can make the future better. Um, and that's what really made me become a professor, because I can keep learning and I can keep transmitting knowledge to my students. Uh, and you see here uh, the playing with Lego, and I always was playing with Lego when I was little because I really liked the fact that I could build any structure and then unbuild it and rebuild something new indefinitely, right? And I think this is what got me into circular architecture in the sense of reusing building materials uh, as opposed to a linear economy in which we extract raw materials, we produce materials, we use them, and then we dispose of them. So I think we need to go towards a more circular construction industry in which we do much more reuse of buildings and building materials. Now, as an engineer and as a scientist, I had the opportunity to work for the engineering company Elliot, which was doing the renovation of the Centre Pompidou in Paris. And they needed to replace the beautifully bent glass from these famous hallways and escalators, which are known as the caterpillar, la chenille de Beaubourg. And because of changing security norms, they needed to replace this glass. But I thought, well, surely we will find some architects who want to reuse this glass, right? So they had even written a book about it. Um, but there is a long process of carefully disassembling this glass and then finding a new home for this glass. But luckily, I called everyone I know in my network in Paris. And through some colleagues, I found the firm called Maximum, uh, who just opened a chain maximum architecture, uh, and had a client who was looking for this beautifully bent partitioning wall, which was a perfect fit for the reuse of this glass. Now, I was thinking this is a very uh, serendipity uh, kind of situation where I happen to be in the right place at the right time, calling the right people. Um, but surely, if you want to reuse more building materials, and not just materials from iconic buildings like the Centre Pompidou, we need technologies that help us do this in a more efficient way. So that's why I became a professor. I wanted to learn a lot from how we can make these technologies to make a circular economy more efficient than a linear economy. So today I want to share with you the four aspects that teach me a lot and the things that I learned from. So I learn a lot from history, from historical structures and historical ways and technologies that sometimes have been forgotten. I learn a lot from culture, from my own culture, but also from other cultures, by traveling. I learn a lot from nature. Nature is the best teacher out there. 
and I learn a lot from emerging digital technologies. With these technologies, we can do a lot of things that we couldn't even dream of a few years ago. So I will show you a few examples in this talk. Some I've worked on, some I haven't, uh, but I think all of them combine at least two of these four aspects that I learned from. So here is the Pantheon in Rome, which is, uh, has a concrete dome that has been there for about 2,000 years. And I think we can learn a lot from this uh, architectural piece. First of all, uh, these coffers that you see are not just aesthetic, they're also there to take away materials where we don't need them, so it makes it a very material efficient dome. In a sense, it lowers the amount of materials that we need, and so the embodied carbon of a structure, but also the ingredients of this concrete. For long, we've thought that they were kind of a poor quality control, but then we realized through a study at MIT that when cracks form in concrete, which it always does, the water that goes into the cracks reacts with the ingredients of this concrete and then forms a solution with calcium that actually fills the cracks and makes the concrete stronger. So it's a self-healing concrete. Now, another thing we can learn from this building is that it has been there for 2,000 years, and it shows that if you value architecture, if you value the materials, and if you value the cultural heritage, you can also last longer. Now, a counterexample is this other concrete dome, the King Dome in Seattle, which was demolished only 24 years after its construction, even though it was designed to last a thousand years. And in Switzerland, 80% of all waste comes from the construction and demolition sector. So we have a huge role to play as architects and engineers to uh, reduce that. That's why I teach my students how to disassemble a building carefully so that we can reuse its materials. And this is the, the disassembly site that uh, Daniel was mentioning, where Liz Larner and him came to visit me. And in only two days, my students were able to disassemble this entire building. And we then reused the materials for a student project. We used computational design algorithms that we developed together with MIT for uh, designing these domes. And this algorithm was making sure that we used the smaller beams first and that we have the minimum amount of waste. And this is the dome that we then built with the students, also only in a few days on, on the campus at ETH. It's still there if you want to visit it. And this is Bigminster Big Fuller, the inventor who made geodesic domes famous. And he said to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I really like this citation because this is how I look at circular construction. It's a new model, which is actually going back to previous knowledge, um, but it needs to make the linear model obsolete. It needs to make this extraction, use, and dispose model obsolete, and we can only do so by making it faster, cheaper, and more efficient and easier to construct in a circular way rather than a linear way. Now, Buckminster Fuller also asked, how much does your house weigh? And I thought that was a very interesting question, and that's what made me do a PhD at MIT about the weight of buildings and their embodied carbon. So I started collecting the weight of thousands of buildings worldwide and compared them and looked at their embodied carbon. And I discovered interesting things. Uh, for example, uh, Olympic stadiums don't all have the same embodied carbon, although they have the same function. So we saw in our talk, in the talk with Ai Weiwei yesterday, that uh, verseness was also used or misused for symbolic reasons, but I think we can also learn from those structures. How come the Beijing Olympic Stadium has more than 10 times the embodied carbon compared to the London Olympic Stadium? And so I did a workshop with the International Olympic Committee in Lausanne to kind of see if we could disassemble and reassemble these structures because it's a bit crazy that we build such huge infrastructure for a single event every four years in another city. <laughs> So I've, I found this very interesting uh, answer, which is a bit utopist or futurist, from uh, Vincent Calabot, another Belgian architect. It's the day of Belgian architects today. Um, and, um, and he thought about why don't we build a stadium on a ship that can kind of float from city to city. Uh, so he called it Oceaniums. Um, and he thought about how we can we use reuse materials, how can we use renewable materials, and how can we make a whole uh, biodiversity system on there to improve 
uh, the, the, the world instead of depleting the resources. So I also like to travel, and I travel to the Machu Picchu in, in Peru, and this is an incredibly inspiring space uh, with, a, with a real genius Loki, a real spirit of the place that helped construct this. And not so far from this uh, Machu Picchu is this Inca bridge, this Winchiri bridge, where villagers on both sides of the river come together every year in a three-day festival where they cut the grass from the hill and they weave this into this bridge. So this construction tradition has been there since the Inca times. I think this is really interesting also, this transmission of knowledge throughout time. Another woven bridge is this living bridge. There are multiple living bridges in this area that helps these people cross the flooded areas when it's flooding season. And they're using the roots of the, bridge, uh, the, roots of the trees and the trees to grow into a bridge. So it's really growing architecture instead of assembling it. Now, this, this image comes from the book Low Tech by Julia Watson. She will be in Zurich in February if you're interested in learning more about these indigenous um, technologies. Someone else who is really inspired by this aspect of growing of nature is Neri Oxman at the Mediated, Mediated Matter Group at Media Lab in MIT. And she built a silk pavilion where she ordered a bunch of silkworms to put on this digitally fabricated structure. I wonder what they were thinking at MIT when they saw the order uh, of the silkworms. But they were really growing this structure. And I think this is also interesting. This is how nature works, right? We grow structures. We don't fabricate it uh, by depleting our resources and then producing waste. Another material that grows really fast is bamboo. It's a very renewable material, and it's also a very strong material in the sense that it sets the material where you need it to be, at the outside of the tube. And you see here a beautiful bamboo cathedral designed by Simon Velez with this very renewable material. You don't need the material necessarily to be strong um, to make a big and beautiful structure. You can also build something in paper. This is the Paper Palace uh, by Shigeru Ban. And so even materials like hardware and paper, when you use them well, when you design it well, then you can actually make big, beautiful structures. Another example of this is the Mapungubwe Interpretation Center in South Africa, which uses the Guasavino tile vaulting system, which my uh, PhD advisor at MIT had written a book about. And it's kind of rediscovering an, a, a technology that would otherwise have gone lost. And it's using earthen tiles, which are actually not so strong. But by using it in this configuration, it makes a very strong and thin vaulted space. And I think uh, uh, I, if I had known that Mr. Foster was there today, I would have also shown his drone airport, uh, which also uses this technology. So I think it's also important to look at ancient technologies and not lose them. And sometimes there are rituals that kind of perpetuate this knowledge throughout time. And here is an image that Guy Nordenson gave me uh, because he was able to assist the ritual that happens every 20 years for rebuilding the Ise Shrine in Japan. This is actually very hard to, to go to because it's a sacred place. And every 20 years they disassemble this shrine and they rebuild it exactly as it was designed. And this is meant to transmit this knowledge of these technologies like the Japanese joinery from generation to generation. And so we did this also with uh, cabins for a school, for a school in the forest in Saxon, where uh, we looked at typical Swiss construction technologies from before in the mountain, so it's the same technology as all of the chalets that were in that mountain, and we looked at it so we could transmit to the students, to the uh, children from the school, and in the next video you will see the participatory nature of it. Uh, of the children kind of learning about these technologies, and this was happened also to be a technology that makes it disassemblable. So it's all about transmission. This is also what made me become a, a professor. It's transmitting also to the next generation and not forget these uh, technologies. Another ancient technology is this reciprocal roof, which um, has been around since the 12th century in Chinese and Japanese architecture. And we applied this for this roof, where you put one beam on top of the other, on top of the previous one, 
and when you have the full circle, it stands by itself. So it's not only a very good structure, but it's also very beautiful and inspiring. It was the roof of this yurt. Um, and this is another roof of another yurt, which happened to be my home. So this was my home in Belgium. I lived, lived in a Mongolian-style yurt that was adapted to Belgian climates. And um, what I liked about this, we knew that we weren't going to stay in Belgium uh, for long, and uh, we, when we moved to uh, Switzerland, we disassembled the entire yurt, because this is supposed to be nomadic architecture, and uh, we left no trace of our presence on the ground. Um, another example from Belgium is this uh, Maison du Peuple from Victor Horta, who is a famous Art Nouveau architect in Belgium. And he, we had to, well, not me, I wasn't born yet, but in uh, 1965, uh, they had to disassemble this building, but they thought the structure was so beautiful that they stored it for about 35 years until they found a new home for it. And this is the Hortazal in Antwerp. And I'm showing this structure because I think when you build beautiful structures that people value, they actually do the effort of storing it and reusing it. Now, of course, we cannot expect to store about 35 years materials, because that would be way too expensive. So what we need is digital technologies that can help us digitize all of the materials that we have and then make a database so that we can connect them to people who need these um, building materials. And so we developed technologies at ETH uh, to digitize the existing building stock. So here we laser scanned the, the, the Hortazal, and we made a point cloud out of the building. And then we also use images and photogrammetry to do this. And then we use computer vision to identify which materials are which. And so we're developing these machine learning algorithms that help us identify and digitize uh, the building stock. Now, to do this on a bigger scale, we also use cadastral data and public record data. This is an image of the, the, the city of Zurich and when buildings were built. We supplement this with image-based data, sort, such as historical photographs, social media images, Google Street View images. And then we apply um, computer vision algorithms and machine learning algorithms on this data. So here, for example, you see a Google Street View image, and we recognize where the windows are, what materials are in the facade, what condition is the facade, and where are the cracks, so that we can predict which buildings will be demolished, will be renovated, when materials will become available for reuse, and in what condition they are. So, of course, it would be much easier if when we build something or when we reuse these materials, there is some kind of way of knowing who made the materials and what is the material and in what condition and so on. And I got inspired by these brick stamps that have been around since Babylonian times that kind of give you an indication of who made the brick, but it also tells you when it was made uh, and other information about what kind of brick is it. And I thought, wouldn't it be great that every material has some kind of tag some, an RFID chip or a QR code or an NFC chip that kind of can be scanned and leads you to a database of what is this material, what are the dimensions, what condition is it, where was it before, what has it been through, so that we can actually have information to design with. So a material passport of the building. And so on the beams that we um, disassembled from the building that Daniel and Liz Lerner have visited, we engraved QR codes to make a pavilion at ETH, the dome pavilion. And the idea was that everyone could come and scan the QR codes on each beam and have information about it, so that if they want to reuse it in their projects, they have the right dimensions and specifications. So the, the, goal, the ultimate goal is really to connect people with each other. I want to connect people who have materials available for reuse because they're disassembling their building, and people who want to design with reuse materials. I want to create a Tinder for reuse. <laughs> <laughs> going further in that automation, uh, I was also, um, because I'm at ETH and I'm part of the NCCR on digital fabrication, and some of you have seen Benjamin's work last year, I was also thinking about how can we use digital fabrication techniques to help us with reuse. Now, robotics 
is not yet at a stage where we can go to a demolition site, which is dusty, which is cluttered, which has a lot of heavy materials. We need some more advancements in robotics, but there are some studies already about how to assemble and disassemble buildings with robots, which was, would also help with the dangerous task of disassembling. This is a study from Princeton. Here you see robots in Zen Robotics, which are using AI to detect which material is which from a construction waste recycling facility, where they uh, put the uh, <laughs> beams in the right bin. So I think you saw here that they put some wood in the bin on the right. And I want to go one step further and not just recycle, like Daniel was mentioning in his introduction, but I want to reuse these uh, construction waste elements. And to do so, for example, for timber beams, we need to remove all of the screws and nails that are in there so that we can easily rework these beams. And here is work from Urban Machine in the US, which also uses AI and robots to de-screw and de-nail um, these reclaimed timber beams so we can reuse them. We can also use digital fabrication to build entire buildings. Here is a 3D printed house in earthen materials by WASP. So we can also think about these new digital fabrication techniques and how this can be used for more renewable materials and natural materials. So I also used digital fabrication for the dome project. Here you see me disassembling a pipe uh, from the building that was set for demolition. Uh, but the pipe was not the exact dimension I needed for the connection of my dome because that's how it happens in reuse. It's not always a perfect fit, and so we need to make it a perfect fit, and therefore I use digital fabrication techniques such as CNC milling, where we use this OSB plate that would have otherwise gone to waste, and we cut round shapes that would strengthen these pipes. This would have taken us hours to do by hand, and it wouldn't have been precise enough to do uh, what it needed to do. What I like about this is that it used to be a pipe, and it's now a connection, and like another Belgian <laughs> artist said, this is not a pipe. I think this is how I look at buildings. It's not because it was a pipe one day that it needs to be a pipe tomorrow. We can be creative in the usage of our material components. And that's what we did with the dome. And I think, I talked about this pipe connection. I think the most important takeaway that I want you to take home is um, it's all about connection. The most important lesson I learned is Reuse only happens because you connect the right people, like we saw for the Centre Pompidou, for example. Um, we need to connect people, and that's why I wanted to create this Tinder for reuse. Uh, but I think um, what gives me hope for the future is that I was invited as an engineer, as a scientist, as an architect at an art talk, and I think it's very important to connect disciplines, art, science, engineering, architecture, and way more, because that will give me hope for the future that we can go towards a circular construction. Thank you. I lost uh, control over the whole schedule, but I would say let's do um, um, one question. Many thanks. Catherine, is there a Belgian in the space who would like to ask something? <laughs> uh, who, who would like to ask uh, a question to Catherine, please? Oh, you got one. Hello. I, I really enjoyed the talk. It was super interesting. I was wondering if this idea of database where uh, the constructor can put the materials uh, that they that is able to be reused and their location um, and connected with people who will be able to build with it, is it something that is already happening? And my other question is like, ha, like I think that would be something very interesting for artists and art institutions as well, because so much of the materials of the drywall and the pedestal could be reused and it's just an absence of knowledge that uh, is, is, is in the way, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for your question. I think, uh, let me scoot over so I can see you. <laughs> um, I, um, actually, we, we learned uh, also from the artist world, because a lot of artists actually do reuse of materials. 
And one example here in Switzerland is Materium, who does this for architecture, where they connect people who have uh, demolition sites and people who want to reuse building materials. And they started out as um, ressourcerie of, um, of materials for artists. Um, so it is something that is also very valuable for artists. Um, and it does exist. There's many platforms that already exist. Uh, maybe some of you might know Madaster, which is doing this more for the future. So when you build something new, you uh, put in your building information model with all of the data attached of your building for the future. There's um, platforms that do it also from whatever is already in the existing building stock. Um, in France, there's, for example, CycleUp who does that. Um, in, uh, there's many different kind of business models in that. In Belgium, Rotor is very famous for that. Uh, in, in Switzerland, there's many companies going from Salsa to Materium uh, that have uh, tiny differences in business models. We're trying to uh, kind of put them all together uh, into uh, a, an association called Circla here in Switzerland, um, where, um, because the, the idea is that when you, for example, want to reuse a door, there's many doors that are easily uh, um, reusable. But then you have to go on five different platforms kind of to find the right fit. So we want to kind of harmonize this. Uh, there is also Use Again in Switzerland that's trying to do that. So I think one important way with these databases is that we harmonize things and that we and reuse needs to happen also on a very local scale. And so I also don't want it to happen too much on a national scale. Look, for example, if you want to reuse something in Basel, uh, I want it to be possible to read something from France or from Germany as well, right? That you're not just limited because it's one government who did the, the, the database. So there's lots of research to be done about how we actually built this database so that it's actually useful for construction because this only can happen if it's on a large scale and we have a, a large amount of materials available in the catalog. Thank you. One more last question. Um, there is a question there. Thinking this big, this would mean that we can reinvent capitalism because this would maybe then also bring corporates like the cement industry mm -hmm. to collaborate with you and really, and really, I think, also think uh, differently about growth. Are they co cooperating already? Yeah, I have lots of uh, interesting conversations with Holcim uh, at the moment, for example. They are um, definitely aware that they need to become more circular for their business to be sustainable in the future. And, um, um, uh, so, and they are already doing a lot of projects, uh, large scale, and I think it's very important to talk to those big companies because um, it's very easy in my world of environmentally uh, friendly environmental activists, a lot of people are kind of anti-capitalist or anti these big companies who are polluting, but I think actually it's very interesting to talk with them and to work with them because they have really the power to change. Um, I, I had a conversation with someone from Holzim who told me like they alone are a certain number of percentages of the whole, all of our greenhouse gas emissions. And so if they change, it really has an impact. So I want to, of course, I show I showed also small projects because it's also about transmitting to the students and I want something that is manageable in the classroom. But I also work with big companies because I think if they change, then it really has an impact on the, on the environment. Can I just say sure. I really just like to reassure both of you that um, that really it's what you're showing is a very important tip of, of a much larger iceberg a movement um, if, if, if I just give an example of two very large projects one is the Apple headquarters in Cupertino California and the other is the J.P. Morgan Super Tower, which is growing quickly out of Park and 47th, the tallest building in Manhattan after the Freedom Tower. And Cupertino, the original site, was 24 buildings. And those 24 buildings, something like 98.5% has been recycled 
and the concrete shredded and again reused in the foundations of the new building. And the same story in terms of growing a super tower in Manhattan. And remember that when you have a good network of public transport and everybody, nobody's kind of driving their individual car, that a tall tower is highly sustainable because it's anti-sprawl, it's the compact city, it's the walkable city. So there is a synergy here. And if I take that tower, again, almost 99% of it right down to the fluorescent light tubes in the original Union Carbide building. And so that recycling or reusing is, is alive and well at the corporate level. Um, and uh, I think, it, sorry? Yes, I mean, Holson, again, um, it, it's, it's a much wider subject. I mean, companies like Holsim uh, are working towards lower carbon concrete. So at the same time, at ETH, you've got studies where you can demonstrate that by more intelligently using concrete, uh, you can do more with less to quote Buckminster Fuller. Um, uh, but again, there are a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, it, it, it's not the nature of the material, it's how you use it. Mm -hmm. So if you take the concrete in apple, uh, it's prefabricated. It's not only the bars that are giving it structural strength, but you're running small bore pipes, so it's the environmental system. You're polishing it mm -hmm. as if it was marble. You're, that's the finish. Mm -hmm. You're not then adding layers of carbon intensive material. So if you're using a material like that and stretching it to its limits, mm -hmm. and it's doing many different jobs, then it's highly sustainable. Yeah, and if I, I could go on, yeah. and I don't want to go on too long, <laughs> but, but, but anyway, but if no, but just to say congratulations, I loved your talk, and Thank I loved you. everything behind it. Uh, it was great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.